Welcome to this introductory video where we're going to talk through some basic tips and tricks for navigating your way around the nervous system. It's an introduction to neuroanatomy. The video is from the Swansea University Medical School and it's primarily aimed at Swansea University Medical School students, though it should be useful for anyone who wants an introduction to some of the basic terminology we use when we navigate our way around the brain. These are the learning outcomes then for the Swansea University medical students to identify, first of all, a series of terms that are related to how we navigate our way around the nervous system, rostral, anterior, caudal, posterior, inferior, ventral, and superior dorsal. Then we're going to talk through the four major lobes of the brain, frontal, parietal, temporal, and occipital. And then we're going to talk through a whole series of different brain regions that are listed here. We're going to talk a little bit about where they are, where they are on 3D models and prosections, and then briefly touch on axial brain scans. Before we get into it, I want to talk about why we're going to go through all of those different brain regions, what it is about those brain regions that makes them important for an introductory neuroanatomy video. We're going to talk a bit about the function of those regions, what they do and what happens when they go wrong. But the most important feature that these regions have for us in an introductory neuroanatomy video is that they are important landmarks. It's quite easy to see where the ventricles and the hemispheres and the corpus callosum are. It's quite easy to see them on a model, on a prosection, and also on scans. If you know where you are, if you know where the corpus callosum is, if you know where the ventricles are and the brainstem and so on, then it's easy for you to figure out where other regions of the brain are. They're landmarks to help you navigate your way around the nervous system. And that's the principal reason why we're covering them in this video. All right, let's go to this first learning outcome then, some of the terminology. And we're going to start with a shark, because why not? We're going to start with a shark because the first term that we want to cover is the term dorsal. Most of you will be familiar with the idea that sharks have a dorsal fin. It's the big fin on the back of the shark. Opposite to dorsal then is ventral. And so when we're talking about sharks and when we're talking about human beings below the neck, dorsal means stuff coming off the back, ventral means the stuff coming off the belly. These same terms apply to us in the same way that they apply to sharks. Similarly, almost, a rostral and caudal. Caudal means toward the tail. So in our case, in the case of human beings, towards the base of the spine. Because this is an introductory video, these are going to be terms that may not be immediately familiar to you. So I'm just going to give you some tips to try and remember them. Dorsal, I've already explained, is easy to remember if you think about the dorsal fin of a shark. And most of us have an understanding of what that is. If you remember dorsal, then the chances are it's going to be easier for you to learn ventral because dorsal and ventral are going to come together very commonly in the literature that you're reading. Similarly, rostral and caudal. As long as you can remember one of those, then you're going to be in good shape because they're always going to come together. Caudal means tail. It's not necessarily intuitive. You want a tip to remember rostral is to think about rostral being nostril. The rostral end of any animal is normally more or less where the nostril is, particularly uh, with sharks and obviously with human beings as well, as we'll see. If you can remember that rostral means nostril, then rostral is going to come with caudal and you're going to be in good shape. Now, we are arranged in more or less the same way as sharks, but things do take a turn literally once you get in to the brain. Now, this is quite a complicated slide, so let me talk it through in a little bit more detail and highlight in red some key issues. Here then, traveling down the spinal cord or down the rest of the body, you can see the dorsal and the ventral arrangement of the human body. We're arranged in the same way as the shark in that previous image. However, when things get above the neck and up into the brain, things turn literally through about 90 degrees. So that the dorsal surface of the brain, when we're talking about neuroanatomy, is the top of the brain, the top of the skull. The ventral then is sort of towards the chin. Rostral and caudal then are towards the front and the back. Rostral is still towards the nose, but it's all tipped through this almost 90 degree angle. And the reason for that is really just because we are bipedal. If you think about us in relation to similar vertebrate animals, the best way to think about it is in terms of a decorative ornamental rug. This, I believe, is a lynx or some other similar animal like a lion or a tiger. You might see these sorts of rugs in old fashioned country hunting homes. This animal is arranged in the same way then that we might be if we were lying flat. You have the dorsal surface of the animal here, and when the animal is lying in this orientation, the dorsal surface of the brain, the dorsal surface of the skull, is parallel to the dorsal surface of the animal. And the converse is true, obviously, on the flip side, on the ventral surface. What happens in us, of course, is because we now walk upright, our brain is tipped through 90 degrees. 
So if we were lying in the same orientation as that animal was, then this rostral surface would be up here and we'd be facing forward. But it's not. Our head is tipped forward, so we've got the binocular vision facing forward on top of our bipedal frame. Now, some other terms on this slide here. I'm not going to work through them all in great detail. They're here for you for reference. You've got anterior and posterior in front and behind, superior and inferior. And you can see from the learning outcomes we used that it, in terms of the basic neuroanatomy, things like dorsal and superior are used more or less interchangeably, similarly ventral and inferior. Okay, on then to our second learning outcome, the frontal, parietal, temporal and occipital lobes. This is an image that you're going to see very commonly in any of our neuro, uh, neuroanatomy, any of our neuroscience teaching videos. This is the outer surface of the brain with the four main lobes of the brain color highlighted. So you've got the pink occipital cortex, the yellow parietal, the green temporal, and the blue frontal. Now, we're going to go through what the, the detail of these in a second, but I just want to introduce another key term. You can see that the barriers or the borders between these regions are deep grooves or fissures. These are called sulci, and this singular is sulcus. Smaller grooves exist between the different subregions of the different lobes. The detail of the names of these individual sulci will come on to later on. Conversely, then, you've also got these ridges, the, the, the regions in the middle between the different grooves. These are called gyri. And this is a very simple schematic that shows sulcus, the grooves or the fissures, and gyrus, the ridges. Now, if you're new to neuroanatomy, these are probably not going to be terms that have some simple intuitive meaning unless you have a background in the classics. Simple way to remember them then is sulcus being sulk. When we sulk, we fall down, we fall back, we get low. Sulcus then is a groove or a fissure. It's a simple way to remember it. Okay, so back to the, the ma four major lobes then. They are as follows. The yellow here is the parietal cortex. The green here is the temporal cortex. This is like the thumb on a boxer's glove. The brain was a boxer's glove. And the blue is the frontal cortex. Now, there are two hemispheres to the human brain, as we'll see later on. So there is a left frontal cortex and a right frontal cortex, a left parietal cortex and a right parietal cortex, and so on. The back here, then, is the occipital cortex in pink. And this is towards the, the, the back and base of the skull. And then the additional region you've got down here is the cerebellum. And we'll come on to that a bit later on. I'm just going to tell you briefly what these regions do because I think it's important to get some sense of function as well as structure and anatomy. The yellow, the green, and the blue, the parietal, the temporal, and the frontal, these regions are really important for processing almost all sensory information. When you process some sensory information, let's say you hear some, a distant sound, or you smell something, or you feel pain from a cut in your finger, the parietal cortex tells you whereabouts in time and space or whereabouts on your body that sensory information is coming from. The temporal cortex tells you what that sensory information is, i.e. it's pain, or it's the smell of something that we've learned before, or it's the sound of this particular person's voice. The frontal cortex then figures out what to do about it. It's where the frontal cortex organizes and plans our response to any incoming sensory information, integrates it with what our other priorities are, programs the motor commands, and then sends them down our spinal cord to the muscles where they are enacted. All of this we're going to cover in later videos. We will just mention briefly the occipital cortex at the back here. This is primarily, primarily responsible for processing vision, visual information, whereas the other three regions process almost all other types of sensory information. Okay. Before we get into the other regions then, I just want to introduce you to a very basic, simple principle that should help you navigate your way around the nervous system, but also to give you a basic sense of the function of individual brain regions on the basis of their anatomy. Uh, if you want to get a sense of what the function of a part of the brain is, it's helpful to consider how close to the base and center of the brain that brain region is. Let me explain a very basic evolution of the human nervous system and the human brain. Here, then, we have the spinal cord with a very basic primitive vertebrate brain on the top. The brain regions that we have at the base and center of our brain are the ones that we have in common with our primitive vertebrate ancestors. What's happened over time, then, is evolution has added layers to the outer surface successively of our brain. 
What this means then is that the regions that are at the outer surface of the brain, those are the ones that are more evolutionarily recent. Therefore, they are responsible for controlling behaviors that are more evolutionarily recent as well. So the behaviors that we think about as being more complex, more human, they tend to reside in, very simplistically, the outer surface of the brain, the cortical regions we just talked about. The parts of the brain that are responsible, the circuits of the brain that are responsible for controlling our basic human animal behaviors, keeping our heart beating, keeping our lungs inflating, keeping our urine flowing and other basic physiological measures, they tend to reside in the older parts of the brain because those are the functions that we have in common with our more primitive vertebrate ancestors. The consequences are also really important. It's also really important to think about that in terms of the consequences of damage to those regions. If we damage the outer cortical region of our brain, it might affect, say, our speech or our ability to process sensory information, our ability to execute complex motor commands. If we damage the regions at the base and center of our brain, that tends to affect very basic prim primal and important physiological functions like keeping our heart beating and so on. Let me illustrate that when we move on to some of the regions in the next few slides. We're going to talk through this section here. What I'm going to do is talk it through region by region and just illustrate where some key brain regions are, talk very briefly about what they do. And then at the end, I'm going to give you access to an unlabeled diagram of this brain region, and you can test yourself by seeing if you can name the different regions on this unlabeled section. Before we do that, we're just going to talk through some of the terminology that explains how we navigate our way around the different sections. There are axial, sagittal, and coronal sections through the brain, as there are for lots of other uh, anatomical regions. Simple means to remember what these terms mean. Axial, if you think about axial as meaning around, you can see here what the axial section is. This is a, a hypothetical glass plane through a brain. The axial then, section is then around the brain. We can think about a sagittal section as being a split down the center of the brain. The coronal section is in the final of these three, shown in blue here. Again, we're going to go over these multiple times, and you'll come back to them repeatedly as we go through our neuroanatomy journey together. All right, we're going to go through then these major regions of the brain. And as I said before, we're going to approach them from the purposes of anatomical landmarks. We will talk a bit about what they do as we go along. The first region we're going to talk about are the cerebral hemispheres. The brain is basically composed of two smaller brains, a left brain and a right brain that are mirror images of each other. All the structures in the left are mirrored on the right-hand side. This is important, obviously, anatomically. And there's a big ridge down the middle that allows you to distinguish between the two. One of the major systems that connects the left hemisphere and the right hemisphere is the corpus callosum. This is a white matter tract, a whole series of myelinated axons that collect, connect sorry, the regions on the left-hand side with the regions on the right-hand side. This is important anatomically because it's very clear on all sorts of sections and you can see it here with the red arrow. It's also important functionally and goes back to some of the early history of neuroanatomy and neuropsychology. Back in the 50s and before, patients with intractable epilepsy would sometimes be treated by having their corpus callosum cut. This would stop seizures spreading from the left-hand side to the right-hand side or vice versa. One of the outcomes of this was that it did stop people's intractable epilepsy spreading, and so their epilepsy did get a bit better, but it also resulted in them basically having two different functional brains, a left brain and a right brain. The split brain studies, as these were called, told us a huge amount about how the two different hemispheres of the brain work together and what happens when that ability to work together is lost. Just to be clear, Split brain treatments are not the sort of thing that are used currently in modern medicine for the treatment of epilepsy. The corpus callosum then is shown on this different. The sagittal section is here, this big white hoop shown underneath the major cortical regions and on top of the, the midbrain and the other regions on top of the brainstem. It's a very distinct anatomical landmark that, as I said before, will be useful in navigating around other regions of the brain. Now we're going to talk about some regions towards the base. We're going to start with the spinal cord. It's obviously a white matter tract that descends down the spinal cord, conveys all the information about motor commands, and receives information back up around sensory information, and so on. On top of the spinal cord, then, you have three regions, the medulla, then the pons sticking off the front, and then the midbrain on top of those. And between them, those three regions are known as the brainstem. 
If we go back to this important lollipop principle that I talked about earlier on, you will see that these regions are right at the base and center of the brain. This tells you a bit about what their function is, is to keep things like our heart beating and our kidneys filtering and our lungs expanding and contracting and so on. One of the clinical definitions of death is called brainstem death. If these regions die, then our heart stops beating and our other basic physiological functions cease and we are classified as dead. Other regions of our brain and other parts of our body can be very severely damaged, but as long as these regions are okay and continue functioning, then our basic physiological functions can be maintained. We'll move up a little bit now and talk about the cerebellum. We won't talk about it in any great detail except to say the word cerebellum means little brain, and it is more or less a little brain hanging off the back of the main big brain. Let me show you an animation which tells you a bit more about where the cerebellum is in space. I'll just let it play through. You can see here it's a very large structure. Even though it's a fraction of the size of the big brain, it contains more neurons than any other brain region put together. All right, moving up a little bit now, we're going to talk about the ventricles. There are num numerous ventricles. They're marked here, the third, fourth, and uh, third and fourth ventricles and the cerebral aqueduct. I want to be very clear about what the ventricles are and what they're not. They're not actually brain regions in the same sense as the cerebellum, the pons, the medulla, the cortex, and so on. The ventricles are actually bags full of fluid, shown here in this three-dimensional image. I'll, I'll just let you play through. So the regions that you see here in blue are actually full of fluid, full of cerebrospinal fluid. They're bags full of this stuff. The function of the ventricular system then, as I said, is ventricles filled with cerebrospinal fluid. The cerebrospinal fluid is produced by epidymal cell, cells, which line the ventricles on the inside, and it functions in one, read, one way as a shock absorber. If we suffer a trauma or a blow to the head, the, the fluid, the cerebrospinal fluid, can absorb some of that impact. It also acts as a nutrient supply and a waste flush. It's continuously circulating and new cerebrospinal fluid is being continuously produced. It's also important to note that although the key anatomical landmark that I want to show you here is the ventricles, most cerebrospinal fluid is outside the ventricles on the outer linings of the brain. Now then on to some other regions. We're going to talk briefly about the thalamus. I'm just going to show you again an animation which illustrates whereabouts the thalamus is. see the thalamus is now on top of those brainstem regions that we talked about earlier on. That means it is, in an evolutionary terms, a little bit more recent. Its function is a little bit more complex. Again, we'll come on to this in later videos and later teaching sessions. Very simplistically, what the thalamus does is it filters out irrelevant sensory information. All of the sensory information from your skin and other sensory organs comes up the spinal cord through those regions we talked about and gets to the thalamus. The thalamus filters out the stuff that's not relevant and sends on to the cortex the stuff that is really important for whatever task it is you're doing at any one time. Okay, that's more or less it then in terms of the regions we want to talk about. We haven't covered the basal ganglia, we'll go over those in a separate video. I'm going to leave you with this image. You'll be able to label it yourself using the blank one that I've uploaded onto Canvas if you are a Swansea University student. If you've got any questions about the content of this video, please do just let me know. Send me an email. All of the images we've used under the fair use exemption for teaching. Most of them, I have to say, taken from Wikipedia, including the three-dimensional animations. They're an excellent source of anatomical information on Wikipedia, although buyer beware as always. Okay, I'll see you in another video. Bye-bye.